I'm Tommy Salmons. This is Year Zero. I invited activist, agorist, podcaster, and entrepreneur John Bush on the show. John Bush is much more versed in counter economics than I am, and I thought it would be interesting to have someone on that understood counter economics that could explain how people that have been laid off or are feeling um, a lot of pain from this financial downturn during this pandemic may utilize counter economics to sure up their family and their finances. So enjoy. Okay. I am here with John Bush to talk about agorism, agorism, however the hell you want to say it really not so much the philosophy of agorism, but more the counter economics and how people can utilize that in their lives during this difficult financial time. So what's going on, John? Hey, thanks a lot for having me. Really excited to talk about this subject. I think it's going to be uh, very useful for people to hear um, different things that they can begin to do in their uh, personal lives to sure up themselves financially and not be so dependent on uh, the corporatist system that we live under. So I'm really excited to speak to you and I really appreciate you making the time. Yep. Always. It's a passion of mine, agorism and counter economics and especially um, just financial success and financial freedom in general. I think a lot of people struggle in that area and it results in a lot of unnecessary pain and stress for their lives and for their family. So anything I could do to help people to be more free in general, politically free, but also financially free, I'm all about it. Well, and that was something I was telling you about a while ago was I had, um, I, I just recently here in the last few weeks have found in myself interested in agorism and it's mainly because I didn't really know what it was. And, um, as I started reading some articles and listening to some different podcasts that talk about it, I was like, Oh, this is really interesting. And it kind of tied together my entire idea of what libertarianism was. And just to give you a little bit of background, when I started my podcast, I did a lot of, I, I did interview libertarians, but I was also interviewing entrepreneurs and I was, I was trying to, I knew instinctively I had this idea in my mind that these things are tied together somehow, you know, and I was just trying to unravel that knot. And I just, like I said, I, I discovered agorism and I was like, Oh, this is it. This is where it all comes together. And then as I, as I began to talk to some people and I, I realized what the entire counter economic revolutionary stance was, I realized, huh, I'm already doing a lot of these things. So it, it was just one of those things instinctively, I was already moving in that direction. And I think a lot of people are moving in that direction or have already moved in that direction, maybe live their entire lives in that arena and not even, or aren't even aware of it. Yep. And um, the whole philosophy, I think I call agorism a strategy more so than a philosophy, like the underlying philosophy of agorism is consistent libertarianism and Samuel Edward Konkin who came up with the strategy and coined the term counter economics he talks a lot about the importance of consistency between means and ends and he also critiques the libertarian party and political ref reformation movements within the libertarian uh, movement and he talks about how they have an inconsistent means and ends. The end is a free society, but a lot of people want to use inconsistent means, statist means, political activism, for example, changing laws, voting people in office in order to achieve those ends. Um, and so I think that's really a great part of what the, what the philosophy is all about, the consistency there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and I, I agree with you. That's one of the things I, I talked to my dad about. He, um, he's always told me, well, I, I actually sympathize greatly with the Libertarian Party, but the, and, they, and I think they have really great ideas, 
But the problem is they never, they can't get elected. They can't do anything. Nobody's, you know, nobody wants to move in that direction. So what are some useful tools from libertarianism that I can use in my everyday life that creates yeah. freedom for myself, you know, kind of like the Harry Brown idea, how I found freedom in an unfree world. And, and so that was, that was a real motivator for me in, in, in seeking out somebody who was versed in agorism, because I really believe that your, your brand of libertarianism, so to speak, and I don't mean that derogatory, I'm just saying, uh, just dis distinguishing between, you know, the political libertarianism and the agorism, um, your brand is, is more dependent on the person, the individual taking action for themselves. So could you give us a, a good definition of counter economics? I know uh, we were talking about this beforehand. Yeah. And, and you mentioned earlier, you said that a lot of people are already engaged in kind of counter economics and they just don't know it and recognize mm -hmm. it. And that's one thing that Konkin encourages as a means of educating people about agorism and counter economics. He encourages, he says, there's already people that are involved in counter economic activity, which we'll get into the definition. Um, and, but they don't know about the philosophy of liberty. Conversely, mm -hmm. there's already people that are libertarians, but they don't know about the strategy and the action of counter economics. And so one thing that we can do as counter economists is educate the libertarian movement about these counter economic solutions and strategies so they can achieve more freedom. And I had that kind of epiphany in Eureka in my evolution as an activist. I've been involved mm -hmm. in activism for peace and freedom, for truth and justice since 2002. And for the longest time, for about 10 years or so, or a little less than 10 years, it was all about educating people, quote unquote, waking people up to like false flag terrorism and all the evil things government does. And then it was about libertarianism and trying to get politicians to do the right thing, trying to sway elections, trying to change policies. And we did have a lot of success with the political action committee I helped to co-found called Texans for Accountable Government. They're still active to this day over 10 years now, which is cool. But we, we would push back on, for example, police officers being trained to do phlebotomies, which are blood withdrawals. Mm -hmm. um, and we were successful in stopping that in Austin. We also pushed back on the Big Brother fusion center systems at the state level, uh, pushed for cannabis reform. But really, I realized that rather than even taking a step forward towards more freedom, in reality, we were just slowing the growth of government and, and just barely hindering the growth of government. But in the time it took for us, not even to take one step forward, but to slow the five steps back, there were other places where government was taking 10, 20, 30 steps back. So I quickly became to realize there's got to be a different way. And that's when I started focusing more on solutions and the idea that we can make choices and actions in our own life to live more free in our own lives. And then if more enough people do that collectively, and if we organize with one another to do that, then we can create the free society that we all want without having to wait for the general public or even the politicians to catch up. And counter economics is basically like how you can go from here to there. And there's a great, there's a broad definition of counter economics that I'll start with that Samuel Oliver Konkin lays out in the New Libertarian Manifesto. He says, the actual practice of human actions that evade, avoid, and defy the state is counter economic activity. So in there, that encompasses doing this podcast, for example, because we're defying the state, right? It encompasses mm -hmm. uh, perhaps even going out and doing some direct action. Um, like for example, I sell Kratom which is a powderized leaf of the Kratom evergreen tree, but it's illegal in six states and the state doesn't like it. The FDA doesn't like it. They don't even want it to be sold as a dietary supplement. It helps people with chronic pain, stress, anxiety, but I'm selling it anyway. And like, we can't take credit card. We got to do an end run around that with e-check and stuff. But that's an example of a counter economic activity because it defies the state. Then there's a more specific definition of counter economics, which would be engaging in black and gray markets. Black markets being those activities, businesses, services that are expressly prohibited by government. Gray markets being those activities which aren't necessarily prohibited, but you have to ask permission through the form of a permit or licensing from the state before you can engage in those activities. And so Konkin encourages people 
not only to engage and just define the state in general, which would be counter economics, but more specifically to participate and grow and proliferate the black and gray markets that are outside of the state's reach. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and that's, that's where I see most people are uh, kind of ignorant to the counter economic argument is the gray market. Um, where, whereas a, a lot of us that grew up in the country, you know, in Texas, uh, Louisiana, I'm from Louisiana originally. Um, we, we know what a shade tree mechanic is, you know, and these guys didn't ask permission to, to open a shop. They just, you know, parked their, parked up under a tree and, you know, they would fix cars that would come here. And you, you have a lot, uh, you see a lot of, uh, fruit stands or, or vegetable stands, especially in the small towns in Texas. So you see people that are operating in this, in this manner that have no idea about it. So whenever, um, whenever somebody is in a dire situation, like so many people are now with like 10 million people newly filing for unemployment, how can they view the counter economic measures in such a way that could help them and move them forward? What are some things that they could start doing to create at least um, some success or some financial backing for themselves using the counter economics? Sure. Yeah, I appreciate that shade tree example. And many people, again, that aren't libertarians or even radically anti-state engage in counter-economic activity all the time. For example, I, I bet it's the case that more than half of the American public cheats on their taxes in some way or another, you know, writing stuff off or shifting this around or hiding mm -hmm. this little transaction that took place. Uh, same thing with garage sales. Nobody's charging sales tax. And um, I know a mechanic that sold his physical location. They own the property and they made a lot of money off of that. And then he simply continued the mechanic shop at his home in the garage, arguably against licensing or against um, homeowners association, maybe, although it's a cool part of the town and it's pretty laid back, it seems. Yeah. But uh, yeah, a lot of people are already doing it. And with the coronavirus stuff going on and the decimation of the economy from these crazy shelter ins, uh, counter economics is more prevalent and more important than ever. And so, yeah, it's basically like just scrappy economics. So um, one thing I did this video the other day, four tips to thrive and to survive and thrive financially during the coronavirus times the sh in the shelter and economy. Mm -hmm. And the first tip was to take this opportunity to learn new skills, to engage in self-development, exercise, growth, sales training, uh, learning new trades rather than binge watching Netflix. Now, I binge watch Tiger King, of course, but most of my time is spent <laughs> working on my business and growing my business, not just vegging out in front of the couch. And I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of Americans that are gonna take this time just to take a little mini vacation, an at-home vacation. But that's not what we ought to be doing. We ought to be learning, learning new trades and skills. Um, the second tip was if you're an employee and you still have your job to make yourself indispensable to your employer. So you add so much value that if they do have to do layoffs, they'll think twice about laying you off. But the third tip, which can apply to this question was to follow the money in this shelter in economy. So where are people spending money? What industries are thriving? Not to mention projecting forward it's likely that there could be a second wave of this coronavirus, which I personally think, and that's not me personally, but a lot of the statistics are showing that it's gonna end up being less deadly, there's gonna be fewer deaths, the mortality rate's gonna be far lower than the two to 4% that was projected, at least here in the United States, which is the audience we're talking to. And so we all gotta start thinking about, okay, what is life gonna be like on the other side of this? And if you happen to be unemployed now, and you had a job that wasn't considered a quote, essential service, I personally think any business that's paying someone and putting food on their table and sheltering their family is essential, right? To at least the individual and that family there. Right. Um, but it's also essential to the people that are, you know, finding value from it. Um, but nonetheless, if you wanna be more resilient in 
the new status quo, which apparently is that governments can just order everyone to stay in their house and, and nobody resists that. Well, there are people resisting in Idaho, Idaho, for example, but like, okay, moving forward, what skills can I learn in this time? What skills can I do if you're a libertarian you know, and you don't want to pay taxes and you want to do it black or gray market? Like what's some scrappy services that I can learn that I can do under the radar of the man and keep all my money? For example, plumber, landscaping, uh, electrician and stuff. This would be examples of gray markets because an electrician's required to get a license and stuff. And a mm -hmm. plumber, I think, is probably needs a license. But on top of that, you don't necessarily need a business license, which I think is a false thing a lot of people think, at least in the state, great state of Texas, which is a little more free, especially business-wise than other states. You don't even need a business license to engage in a business. You can just be a sole proprietor. Um, but yeah, so that, that's, that's what I would encourage people to do to, to think about to do little mental exercises on what are people spending money on? So obviously people aren't leaving the house a lot right now. So they're doing deliveries. They're doing a lot of online activity. So if someone knows a lot about a particular subject, like me, for example, I could do an online course and charge $29.95 to teach people how to do counter economics or about agorism, or you mm -hmm. do a podcast. So if you were out of work, you could do um, a podcast, a, a online course on how to podcast and how to use podcasting to grow your business or your audience. Um, people, anybody could do that and you don't have to tell the government about it. That's a cool thing. Another mm -hmm. thing there's like uh, Instacart and Uber eats and stuff. Mm -hmm. So if you sign up with one of those groups, chances are, I think most of them do like a 1099 arrangement, unless you're in communist California, which just turned everyone into employees in the gig economy. But who says that you have to use Instacart or Uber Eats? Maybe you could just start your own little micro service because there's one thing I noticed, sometimes the Instacart doesn't show up. You get put at the very back of the line. So if you started a little scrappy service where you reach out to your community and you just take their order and then go to the grocery store, you know, it could even be more one-on-one -on -one than Instacart. You could get the person on the phone and be like, hey, we're out of this. There's just all sorts of opportunities and it's up to the individual to take those opportunities rather than sitting on their butt. The fourth tip I gave was that we need to have a 10X mentality. It's from this guy named Grant Cardone. Mm -hmm. And it is like the 10X movement is you 10X the expectations on how much work it's going to take to achieve your goals. You 10 X your goals. So like if your goal is to make a hundred thousand dollars a year, why not just 10 X that and say your goal is to make a hundred, a million dollars. Let's say you come up short and you only get to that to 20%. You're still now at 200,000 then instead of a hundred thousand. And it's a lot sexier and more motivating uh, to, to shoot for the stars, right? If you shoot for the stars and you come up short, you end up on the moon nonetheless. And so, yeah, it's 10x the energy, 10x the work, 10x the exercise, 10x the books that you're reading, 10x the online information you're consuming to grow your skills. And so, yeah, that's some advice that I would give some people in these coronavirus times. Yeah. And one of the things that popped in my head when you were, when you were talking about um, your, your third tip was Whenever I was, uh, when I was younger, I was actually, I had actually gone to work, uh, with the carpenters union in Louisiana and I got laid off from a job, um, working at Delta Downs because I wasn't 21 yet. I was only 19 and they wouldn't let me work inside and do the sheetrock, um, that we were doing because I was under the age allowed to gamble. And so, um, so I ended up getting laid off and my grandpa at that particular time decided he wanted to do an addition to his house. And so I went and I started doing the work um, at his house and there was, and I was obviously operating in the gray market without knowing at that particular point in time, but there was this guy who was driving a dump truck and he was hauling dirt and gravel for my grandpa to my grandpa's house. And the one thing my grandpa said is, is this guy, you've always heard the, the term be a jack of all trades, master of none. Now this guy is not only a jack of all trades, he's what you call a survivor because if he gets laid off from one, one company or if one industry is, is slow, he's always ha has a backup plan. He has his dump truck at his house. He has a, a plumbing business that he, that he keeps up and going. He does this and he does, all the maintenance, any maintenance that anybody could want done. And he was the, he was just this lone guy in this little bitty town 
in Louisiana and he was, he was well known around the town and everybody used him. And that was a perfect example of somebody using the gray markets and, you know, having multiple skills to be able to stay afloat. Yeah, I love that. And you bring up a good point. There's a lot of value in decentralizing your income. Obviously, you don't want to spread yourself too thin so that you aren't successful in any of the endeavors. The best thing to do is to focus in on one uh, effort that you're really good at, that you 10x your energy and your focus, right? And then when that is chugging along, you're putting systems in place, you're able to maintain and grow it without having to focus on it every single hour of the day, then you add a second stream of income or a third stream of income so that if one of them goes down, for example, my Kratom business, mybravebotanicals.com, back in 2016, the federal government was trying to ban Kratom. And so it's important for me, they, they were unsuccessful and the, when they, the DEA tried to add it to Schedule 1, it awoken a sleeping giant and people were calling their Congress critters and their senators. This was actually an example of a political effort that actually brought about some good. But again, mm -hmm. as I pointed out early on, it was simply slowing the growth of government rather than expanding more freedom, so to speak, right? right. And that's where the value of agorism and counter-economics lies and building alternative institutions is that if we don't want to continue, if we don't want to remain in a re reactionary paradigm where we're constantly catching up, where our movements, our action, our strategy is dependent on what the state is doing, we're constantly reacting to them. We need to step into a proactive paradigm. Um, but people push back. They did not banning banning kratom, but it was a big eye opener for me um, that I need to be more resilient. So now I have a little, another business, bravehealthstore.com, where I sell like hand sanitizer. That's, that's natural colloidal silver, mm -hmm. immune boosting herbs. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the tip is the advice and on that, on that regard, as far as having different side hustles and other streams of income, this is again from this guy, Grant Cardone. He's amazing. You can check him out at grantcardone.com. But he says that when you have multiple flows of income, they should be synergistic and interrelated so mm. you don't like do one business and then you start a business in a completely separate field so for example the dump truck guy maybe he has a big truck and so he does dump truck which is doing trash and stuff but because he has a dump truck maybe he can um, do deliveries of farm supplies for example or, or whatever you know right. staying in that same field or any carpenter has a whole wide range of activities that's all within that so maybe he focuses on remodeling but then he wants to do a side hustle where it's like hey i'll come build a barn or a shed in your backyard that's my new little thing you know right. so i did the kratom and cbd mybravebotanicals.com and then i was like man i need to be more resilient so now i have bravehealthstore.com it's the same type of e-commerce platform but it's different products with a little bit of a different shift but it's still in the same universe and there's a lot of overlap and then the online course thing i think is so effective not only because it's anyone can do it with little to no startup you just have to have some wisdom and be bold enough and courageous enough to go get out there, right? Even if you're not right. super well-spoken or highly polished, you'll get there, right, with practice. Mm -hmm. And so anyone that does something, like let's say podcasting was your business, or you do truck driving, like that's your actual income. So a side hustle could be, okay, I'm going to start putting out content on how people can get started in truck driving, and how and what to look out for, what companies to, what things about a company you should avoid. Uh, here's some, some technology that'll keep you entertained while you're driving. Here's the regulations that you really need to make sure you stay on top of so you don't get in trouble. And then you start churning out Facebook Live, start a YouTube channel, putting out a little email newsletter. And then it's like, okay, I started to build an audience. Now I'm gonna drop the online course. I charge $89.95 or $129.95 because people are like, they're looking people will spend money on good content and good value. And it's like, now I'm going to start, now I have a little side business. I drive my truck. Uh, I earn a living from that, but I want to add to my, I want to get more resilient. I want to expand my money and it's resilient in itself to make more money because mm. when crap hits the fan, like we see with coronavirus, people that are living paycheck to paycheck and then lose their job, they're in a lot of trouble. You know, people right. that have a substantial saving or have passive income, they're able to weather the storm better or entrepreneurs that can be like, Oh, well that little sector got closed down. Now I'm going to go ahead and do this. Like if I had a, a physical storefront 
And because in Austin, they're like, you can retail stores can remain open, grocery stores and stuff that is that supply essential services and, and essential products. But they specifically said CBD stores can't stay open. So the moment if I had a CBD store, a Kratom store, the moment I saw that, I'd be like, I'm going to buy myself some food wholesale and some hand sanitizer and cleaning supplies. And I'm mm -hmm. staying open. You know, I'm going to just shift into something else. So. Right. Yeah, those are all things people can do. And now's an opportunity, right? If you got furloughed, if you got laid off, if you're working from home now, now's the perfect opportunity to launch that little side hustle. So when this all comes, when this all ends and people can finally come out of the woodwork, then you will be more prepared and more resilient to, mm -hmm. to weather the storm when it comes back again, which it inevitably will. Right. And, and one of the important things that you're pointing to is to pay attention and to utilize what resources you will have at hand already. You don't have to go out and make a large investments and this that, and the other, that you can utilize what is at hand already. And, and just as an example, I live on uh, eight and a half acres. Uh, I have a lot of land. So whenever, I'm, whenever I come home on the weekend, one of the things my wife and I are doing is we're raising chickens, we're raising ducks, we're, we're gardening, we're planting, and we're, at, we're making sure that we're planting and gardening for more than what we need. So if it comes down to it, and we need to be able to, to make a little bit of extra money, we can put a sign out, say, you know, selling produce or selling fruits or selling eggs or, or whatever we need to do. And we're just making sure that there's that that little bit of excess that if we need that extra money for whatever reason, that we have something in our back pocket that's going to get us there. And so I think that's really important is paying attention and recognizing what you have at your disposal, what resources you have at your disposal, what skills you already have, and capitalizing on those opportunities that present themselves. Yeah, man, that's great. Um, I at one point had 120 chickens in our little farm. We were on two and a half acres and we were, we had a way huge excess of the eggs that we needed. And so back then we, were doing, we started doing a dime a dozen for eggs, a silver dime, um, mm -hmm. which is 90% silver. And right now it's probably only worth like less than $2. It was worth more. There was a period when silver was $50 back in the day, um, mm -hmm. several years ago. And so we were doing a dime a dozen then for these farm fresh, you know, non GMO fed uh, chickens. Uh, and we were getting like three to $4 for the dime. And then the price of silver dropped significantly. So we weren't able to do that anymore. It, it actually hearkened to Gresham's law, which is that the bad money will get spent first before the good money. So yeah. we ourselves were like, well, people didn't want to spend the dimes. We didn't even want to receive the dimes when they were worth less at the time, like a dollar fifty or two dollars, because we could get dollars for, we get the eggs for more dollars. But I digress. Um, the eggs were a great little side hustle, and gardening in and of itself is so resilient. And in some cases, gardening can be a counter economic activity because they're like regulating gardening in some places across the country. True. But having your own food supply is so important and valuable. And, you know, it's counter economic in that when you go to the grocery store, I don't know about you're in Texas, so we don't have to pay taxes on sales tax on food, but some areas right. have tax on food or if you're buying some processed food or whatever, or even just going to the grocery store and, and buying other stuff or spending, you know, the gas tax to get to the grocery store. If you're able to be more self-sufficient, then you don't have to interact with the status control grid as much and you don't have to spend, you don't have to give as much money to the state in the form of taxation. And you right. can set up the little stand out in front to sell your excess tomatoes and leafy greens and stuff. Heck yeah. 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 Well, and you know, I mean, I have also have a, a pond that I've thought about, you know, just putting out a little sign saying, Hey, you know, $5 a car, you can come fish, no license required, you know? So, it's, <laughs> you know, kind of a middle finger to, to the entire process. You know, that's just kind of one of the way I look at it. You know, how can I, how can I, no, really, I like that? How can I really piss them off and then also offer, you know, maybe a single father who's, doesn't have the money to, to spend a whole lot of uh, money on his kids to go do things, you know, hey, he can, maybe he can afford $5, you know, to go, to come park and fish for the day or whatever, you know? So it's uh, one Yeah, of the, you can stock the pond. Not a bad idea. 
That would yeah, definitely be counter economics. It, it stocked. Uh, I make sure we we can we can eat no matter what happens. <laughs> so that's what cool. I've made sure is I because being a truck driver, I have to make sure that my wife's okay. You know, that's my first priority is making sure she's she's okay while I'm away for a week. You know, at a time. So um, yeah, yeah. So I, I've made sure that there are fish in the pond and there are she has ammunition to hunt with if she needs to, which I she probably wouldn't do unless she was about to starve to death because she just loves animals. Um, and <laughs> you know, but there's, like you said, at least there's some leafy greens and some strawberries and some blackberries and all kinds of different things growing that she, she could definitely eat if worse come to worse. Yeah, man. It sounds like you guys are set up pretty nice. Yeah, we're doing all right, man. We're trying to, we're trying to make sure that we're okay. And that's, that's the main thing. I can't help anybody unless I've, you know, made sure my family's sured up. And that's really the advice I want to offer people is how to sure up their families. So when, when you were starting your businesses um, and you realized that, you, that Kratium was, was under attack, did I say that right? Kratium? Kratium. Kratium. Okay. Kratium was, was being, they were trying to regulate Kratium out of business, out of, out of the market. What made you take uh-huh risk and enter into that particular field? Oh yeah. So, um, it was, I was selling Kratom for like a year before that, maybe eight months before that. And whenever we learned that the DEA was trying to ban it, that's when I was like, Whoa, what's so special about this that the DEA wants to ban it. And I I started taking it more myself and it helped a lot with entrepreneurship and focus and motivation. The the white and green varieties, the red varieties are the ones that people take for chronic pain or instead of prescription pain medicine, for example. But you know, the, the, the funny thing is being an activist and being aware of how the legal system works and how politics works and I knew that the DEA had intentions to ban it. They wanted to emergency schedule it, but I was able to decipher the entire process and know where they were in that process and know that they still had to do this review and they, were, they had a 50 day or like a 30 day comment period for people. And then after that, they would have to take it to do this, that, and the other legal process before they would actually ban it. So I knew that until they actually formally declare that it's on schedule one and now a federal felony along with heroin and LSD and cannabis of all things. I think all those should be legal by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, Until they actually made that decision and announced that it was still totally fair game. So while other Kratom vendors in town and online were shuttering their doors and shutting their doors out of fear, I leaned into the Kratom sales and was able to establish a significant market share. Um, I, this guy, Grant Cardone, again, he says when there, when everyone else is contracting, when there's like a recession or this coronavirus stuff, when there's times of contraction, that's your opportunity to expand and to dominate the sector while everyone else is uncertain and scared and watching Netflix. If you 10 X your effort and your energy and the time that you put into your business or your side hustle, then you are going to take up a significant amount of market share. And when, when everything settles, when the dust settles, then you're going to be in a really good position. And so I, I knew that it wasn't a risk at all. The only risk that I had was if they ban it, I end up with a bunch of product. Uh, Then, you know, I had capital tied up in that. And that brings me to another thing, like a lot of counter economic activity and agorism comes down to an individual's personal risk level, right? And so Mm -hmm. before I had kids, I have a seven and eight year old, before I had kids, my activism was a lot more in your face, uh, camera in a cop's face, shouting down the cops, getting arrested a couple times. Like I got arrested once during an Obama speech here in Austin because I refused to go to the free speech zone. Mm-hmm. And it was on UT campus. They arrested me. And then the second time I got arrested cop blocking, uh, filming some police and kind of being a little uh, nasty towards them. And the guy just arrested <laughs> me. Um, I was found not guilty for the Obama thing. I defended myself and that was really cool. But I actually had a little girl at the time when I got arrested the second time. Mm-hmm. And like my, their, their, her mom, we're not together anymore, but her mom was there just banging on the phones and organizing a rally and stuff. And they came and rallied to my support and my defense. And, and that was like, wow, I can't be doing this now. I have a kid. I can't be spending nights in jail and and freaking their mom out and, you know, 
thankfully my daughter was oblivious to it because he was a baby, but my right. risk assessment changed. I'm now a little more risk averse. So mm -hmm. for example, I also had a shift too where early on I was like, I don't want to make a whole lot of money because it'll be easier to be an agorist and I'll pay less in income tax or no income tax at all. Then I had two kids and was like, I don't want to live in poverty. We've been living in poverty. It's miserable. I'm not providing my kids the opportunities and the life that they deserve, the quality of life and the standard of living they deserve. So I had a shift. At that point, I really leaned heavily into, into entrepreneurship. And so earlier I said that my business is an example of counter-economic activity. It is in that it's, it defies the state. The state doesn't like it. I have to use e-checks, which is like an electronic check because I can't take credit cards. So there's like a workaround. Mm -hmm. I also accept cryptocurrency, although not a lot of people paying crypto, but maybe like two or three or four a month. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's counter-economic in that regard. However, I do have an LLC, a limited liability company. I right. do file income tax, right? Mm -hmm. Back to what I said before, you know, like a lot of people, you can write a lot of stuff off, so to speak. Um, and so someone else that is really into agorism as well is Derek Bros. He doesn't have children. He's willing to live more scrappy, right? Like I, I want to be a millionaire. I want to make $10 million. Hell, I said earlier about 10X in your goal. Why not make the goal to be a billionaire? I want to be like Bill Gates is an evil, diabolical billionaire that's trying to get the whole world vaccinated and have a giant surveillance grid. Well, I'd like to be the counterpart to that. That's like the, the libertarian genius billionaire that's out there plotting an Illuminati of liberty, so to speak, right? And then if you come yeah. up short, man, I land, I only made 100 million this year. That's, that's too bad. But um, so I have my sight set on that. And unfortunately, the, with the climate as it is now, it would be incredibly hard to start making millions of dollars and to defy the tax man, right? So the guy that makes 20,000 a year and you know, does it in a scrappy kind of way, it's easier to fly under the radar. That's a choice that I made personally. Now, mm -hmm. as we grow the counter economy and as we build defense services like Samuel Edward Conkin talks about, as we grow the Agora, it all of a sudden becomes easier for the big businessmen, for the people that are bringing in a lot of wealth to withhold because they have their brothers and sisters there that are, that are doing it along with them. Like, for example, let's say uh, you have 100 people or 1,000 wealthy people in an area, and they're all like, you know what? To collectively, we're going to stop paying our taxes. We're going to shift some of the money we would to pay to the taxes to pay for a private security force, for example, mm -hmm. and we're going to see how this pans out. So risk is an important thing, and um, I definitely don't want to forget to include this, the concept of freedom cells, because it's a really effective way to minimize that risk, but... Yeah. I'll just I was just like, I was actually yeah, everyone I was actually just about to bring up freedom cells because you 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 mentioned a few things that made me think of so I think that's a good place to go from here. Perfect. Yeah. But to sum up, like everyone has a different risk level. And I used mm -hmm. to be kind of back when I was more scrappy and agorist myself, I used to be a little like nose in the air, like Ooh, I'm not paying taxes and I'm so special and stuff. But then it's like, oh yeah, well, the guy that I'm being nasty to owns a house, you know, and, and yeah. makes 120,000 a year. And so it's, it's, it's just apples to orange and we should all have mutual respect for everyone's path. Right. Correct. And again, back to the counter economic definition, he says it's any action that, um, the actual practice of human actions that evade, avoid and defy the state. So you can evade and avoid and like be the scrappy, consistent activist anarchist that doesn't pay the income tax, but you could also use your money to defy the state and to empower groups and to put out publications, so on and so forth. So it's all about, you got to make that decision for yourself. Also on that same token, like know where your line in the sand is, right? Mm -hmm. There's, everyone needs to have a line where they're either going to bug the heck out or they're going to stick around and fight. And hopefully that fight isn't a fight with force, right? Right. Like Thomas Jefferson said, uh, every couple generations, the, the tree of Liberty needs to be watered with the blood of tyrants. And it's like, Whoa, that's a great quote, but that's not the kind of life I want to live. I don't well, want that for I, my kids or my, I, I don't want my grandchildren to fight a revolution. Just a small correction to that quote. He said the tyrant, uh, blood of tyrants and patriots. So, 
you're not exempt from this, <laughs> you know? That's right. That's right. Yeah. And that's, that's the part of it. And so, but at the same time, like, where do you draw the line? There's nothing right. noble about just, well, there is something noble about the Satyagraha, which is, which was Gandhi's strategy, you know, mm-hmm. the peaceful nonviolent resistance, MLK, Jesus Christ as well. So there is a place for that, but I don't know that, you know, I want to, I'm all about self-preservation and preserving the life of my kids. But again, this will yeah. tie into freedom cells. So how can we, how can we opt out of the state? Back to Derek Bros. He has a great book called uh, How to Opt Out of the Technocratic State. But how can we opt out of the state and do so in a way that minimizes the risk to our freedom, our property, and ultimately our lives? And several years ago, I came up with this concept called freedom cells. And this was about the time where I was really formulating and theorizing on how to get from here to there. I knew what there was like, what there could be and the foundational philosophy. It's like everyone's writing books and talking about that. And that's all great and well, right? Like some of my close friends and and thought leaders in the libertarian movement, they're putting out books and doing speeches about why libertarianism is a great political philosophy. It's like, okay, that's great. We want a free society, but it's like, how are we actually going to get from here to there? And so I started really focusing on that. And that's when this concept of freedom cells came about. So um, I had started to hear about small group strategies in multiple different places. One of them uh, was this agorist activist guy in um, Minnesota, I think it was. And he Mm -hmm. talked about the small group theory. Man, I wish I could think of his name right now. They did a conference. Um, I don't remember what it was called, but they invited me to speak at a conference and his whole spiel was small groups. And they gave the example of what their Ron Paul meetup in St. Paul, Minnesota. Like at first it was one big meetup. Then it started to grow to like 40, 60 people. And then they're like, they split it up in two. And they found that they were more effective in these smaller groups. Then they split up groups further in the small, like little neighborhood groups and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh, that's great. And I was already kind of formulating this freedom cell idea. Then I heard uh, Bob Podolsky. He wrote this book called Flourish. No, was it Flourish? Uh, Man, I need to sharpen up my memory on this stuff. I'm just now getting really diving back into the agorism and freedom cell after after talking about it several years ago. Um, And so his concept was uh, groups of eight, he called octologues. And you kind of like dialogue as two people talking, octologue. And then he also had this communication strategy that he really played up. Well, him and this guy named John David Garcia for decades did research and scientific studies to determine the optimal number of people for any group with the same goal. This doesn't have to be radical activist stuff. It could be a business group or a church group or organizing an event or whatever. And they found that eight people is the optimal number for creativity and effectiveness. Whenever you have four people, there's not enough ideas that get shared, not enough people to bring about the ideas. Whenever you have 15 people, there's not enough group cohesion and there's like different personalities are clashing. And he found eight group, eight people as the optimal number Ideally, an equal share between men and women it was also most effective and most creative. And, um, and so I was like, wow, that's, I was already, I was already you know, focusing on the small group. Maybe eight should be the number. And then finally, I heard uh, Stuart Rhodes of the Oath Keepers organization. They launched this initiative to form small little neighborhood and county groups in a series of small groups that would all work with the same goals. And so I was like, wow, now it's time to really formulate this idea and get it out to the public because before I was just thinking about it. And so essentially a freedom cell is a small group, a peer to peer mutual aid group of people acting in conjunction with the same goals. And the group should be as close to the number eight as possible. Could be seven, could be six, could be nine, 10, right? And again, this isn't a top-down thing. It's not like you have to do it this way because who knows the best way to do it and people can do it different ways and we can all share ideas what works best. But ideally, it's around eight people and you set up common goals with that group of eight. And the first four goals I laid out, which are so beneficial for the coronavirus times, the first one was that every group member should have storable food up to three months, also gardens. Every member, the second goal, every member should have an encrypted form of communication or an off-grid non-grid dependent form of communication like cb radios if you're close enough or shortwave radios Mm -hmm. third is that every member should have firearms and know how to use them safely and proficiently 
And then fourth was that every member should have a bug out plan, whether it's a collective bug out plan or their family has bug out plans, but everyone just, and then they all work together as accountability partners to ensure everyone's carrying out those goals. And the way that it becomes beneficial and synergistic to have the group rather than doing it individually, for example, the first goal of getting the storable food, you guys can all pull your money together to get bulk storable food at a discount. The second goal of having the, the firearms is like we can all make the goal of to all use nine millimeter ammunition. And so now we're going to start buying that caliber in bulk, right? Instead of one guy right. having the 22, one guy having the 45, and the other guy having a nine millimeter, we can all get on the same page. And so that's your one group. Mm -hmm. Then the way that this turns into a network is that you start encouraging the creation of other groups of eight to 10 people. And you start telling your friends, your fellow activists, and you're like, hey, we've been doing this freedom cell thing. It's working out really well for us. We're able to reach these common goals. We, I feel like we have a kind of a safety net if something bad were to happen. You guys should try this out, right? Or maybe the individual group grows and it, now you have 15 people and you're like, hey, let's just split this into two groups. Well, imagine you start agitating and furthering the creation of other groups. And before long, you have 10 groups of 10. I'm just going to use the number 10 because it's easy to do multiples. You have 10 groups of 10. Now you have a group of 100, right? So you have the individual groups of 10 who are most dedicated to one another. I call this the inner cadre. Then you have the group of 100, which is dedicated to one another, not to the extent that the little groups are. This is called the middle cadre. Now imagine doing the bulk ammo buy with 100 people or imagine doing the bulk food buy with 100 people or imagine one person's house gets broken into and the group of 100 rallies because they have an instant communication channel like getcell411.com, cell phone one, it's an awesome app. Now let's carry this forward. You have your group of 100. Everyone's out there encouraging people to form these groups. Now you get 10 groups of 100 and you have 1,000 people. So as libertarians and anarchists, everyone's always like, well, what would that look like if you had a free society? What would happen to the poor people? What would happen to the sick? What about health care? So on and so forth. Now we begin to actually have an infrastructure that's entirely voluntary, decentralized, not dependent on hierarchy or coercion or taxation. So for example, let's say in the coronavirus times, two of the group members in the group of 100 uh, lose their job and they have rent coming up. And they're like, hey, my rent's $1,000. We only have $500 for rent. So you put it out to your group of eight. And then the group of eight's like, okay, we're going to put this out to the larger network. You reach out to the larger network. You have a group of 100 people. Everyone just has to chip like 5 to $10. And then boom, you can help subsidize the rent. Now, this right. isn't like a free rider thing because the understanding is that this is going to be um, reciprocal. The people that get support are going to give support. Now let's fast forward to our group of a thousand. Let's say somebody uh, breaks their leg. You could even have a fund. This could all be done with cryptocurrency too, although it doesn't have to be. Sometimes that complicates things. But it's like you, everyone chips in a membership fee or whatever. It's totally voluntary. It's not a tax. And that membership fee is allocated towards different uses, whether it's the group ammo buys, uh, funding the conference for the annual meetup, or healthcare. You have a peer-to-peer a -peer mutual aid health insurance. This already happens, actually. My health insurance is um, it's, it's called Zion Health Share. It's a health share program. Everyone chips in X amount of dollars every month. And then there's like it only starts to kick in after $1,000. But for me, I'm a natural health kind of guy. I don't get sick. I don't, I don't even really – I have a naturopath, but I don't go to a primary care physician if I get the flu or something. I just take care of it myself. But if there were to be an emergency and it ends up costing $20,000 or worse, you know, $100,000 for a crazy surgery emergency, then this health share will come and fund everything above $1,000. And so just the same, this group of 1,000 or the group of 10,000, the group of 100,000, let's say you break your leg, you go to the group and the group pulls the money together, whether on the spot or you have a fund and pays for the health insurance. And then to take this, as we started talking about risk, Imagine you have a group of 10,000 people in a given geographic area. When we have this many people on the same page, people are all of a sudden emboldened uh, through the strength and numbers phenomenon. And so let's say you guys are all, this doesn't all have to be agorists and anarchists. This can be, you know, you can use this strategy for anything, even for political activism, if you want to do block walking and stuff. But now you have 10,000 people and everyone's like, okay, I think, I think we're ready. We're all armed up. 
we're all networked. We're all, we're all very resilient. We all have our bug out plan. We all know where everyone lives and it's mapped out and we're ready to come to each other's aid. So through those groups, the group of 10,000, they elect or they um, choose a, uh, a ambassador, so to speak. And this ambassador goes to the status, to the regulators, to the bureaucrats, to the legislators, to the law enforcement. And they say, hey, I want to share this Declaration of Independence, for example, with you. We have 10,000 people that no longer want to contribute to your system. We will contribute when we use your system, like we go to the parks, or maybe we'll even pay the gas tax because some of that goes to maintain the roads and we use the roads, whatever. But we don't want to pay health and human services. We certainly don't want to pay property tax because we are all, you know, the people, the homeowners that own their homes are no longer going to pay property tax. So we want to talk to you about how we can resolve this because on March 1st or whatever, in 60 days, we're all collectively going to stop paying our property tax and we're all peaceful, productive people. I was not citizens. We're not citizens anymore because we're opting out. We're all peaceful, productive humans. And, uh, we obviously don't want any violence, but we know that's the language that you guys speak when people don't comply with your unlawful edicts, uh, your immoral edicts. So how, we just want to start a conversation because come 60 days from now, we're not paying. We're not letting the tax man on our property. Well, so, you know, an individual doing this has happened. Uh, there's a family up in New Hampshire, and I think they were from Massachusetts, but uh, Jay Noon's one of the guys, Josh Noon's his brother. Their father was like, we're not going to pay our property tax anymore. Of course, his house got seized. There's another friend in New Hampshire, the Radicals with the Free State Project. They lost their house because he wanted to take a stand. And so when an individual does it, you're so much more vulnerable. But imagine 1,000 or 10,000 people doing it at the same time. It would really call the question of how is this going to go about being resolved? And maybe there would be some sort of compromise or depending on how bold the group is, no compromise. And then they call the question and they're like, hey, we're not paying property tax. We're all armed. We're not going to let you take our friend, our community members home. What's going to happen? I don't know. But it just begins to create the possibility, the very real possibility that through the strength and numbers and the unity of the group, you really can bring about some major change when it comes to individual liberty and group right. liberty. Yeah, no, and I really like the the idea, the concept in itself, and um, it's because it it brings in that that sense of community again, and and it's rebuilding yep. communities, and that's we've been missing that in the in the country for a long time. I lived in Houston for I don't know about thirty years, twenty some odd years, thirty years, something like that, and I could not get away from that place fast enough. I hated it because no matter how much, how many neighbors you have and how many people are around, you don't know anybody. You really don't know anybody. So I left and I fled out of, out of the city into the rural life. And I am so much, you know, more sane. I'm so much safer from coronavirus <laughs> uh, because we're not living in a Petri dish anymore. And I know... <laughs> in my community and I it's just it seems like that's what's really missing is that community that that you're talking about building yeah man and interestingly enough you bring up Houston if you would have known Derek Bros, who was active back then with the Houston Freethinkers he was actually building that community and and you know it's it's in the past 10 years it's grown immensely the network that they have they have freedom cell groups now in uh, in Houston and so it, it, the general public really doesn't get it oftentimes. And, and there are people that just, they're always sheltering no matter what. Um, there are people that are the friendly neighbors and such, but you got to take the effort to go out and find them. And that's the cool thing about this freedom cell thing. There's a website, freedomcells.org, freedomcells.org. And if you register and log in, you can find that there's groups all across the world, Australia, UK, all across the U S there's a great big one in Houston and so there's a place people can go to either start a group in their area or to join an existing group. And people will be surprised to see how many groups there already are. And then imagine, you know, if this is best done regionally or in the same geographic area so you can physically protect one another and, and be there to engage in trade a lot easier. Right. But imagine when this network grows to the point where it's, 
it is possible to have the number 1,000 1, or 10,000 or globally to have 100,000. And who knows where it goes from there? Yeah. Well, and once you hit a certain point with, 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 a, with a system like this, it, it kind of reminds me of uh, the whole idea behind network marketing. Once you hit, you know, a certain, certain point, it just starts growing exponentially, you know, and uh, it's kind of, it's, it's that type of a uh, structure, um, so to speak, even though it's, you know, it's not, like you said, it's not centralized. It's something that you're doing voluntarily amongst each other. It's just people cooperating together, creating these little communities and creating this, this sense of camaraderie. And I, I like that. I like the idea. Um, you know, I mean, and, and, and what's interesting is you could see a lot of different freedom cells doing a lot of different things, a lot of different ways. You would kind of get that panarchy, you know, idea that I've always thought that, that it would turn into if there were no government, that everybody would just be kind of voluntarily, voluntarily cooperating, you know, in many different ways. And there would be no ism to, to uh, describe the, the actual structure in which society based itself. Um, and I, I like that idea of, of that, that voluntary cooperation. Yeah, I appreciate the panarchy. Um, I remember Carl Hess wrote an essay called Anarchy Without Hyphens. Mm -hmm. And so there's all this like anarcho-capitalism, anarcho-syndicalism, anarcho-primitivism. And everyone's like, my philosophy is best, blah, blah, blah. But the cool <laughs> thing about agorism well, I guess agorism is more like anarcho-capitalism because there is a here an, an adherence to free markets and capitalism. Um, but I'm with you on, I heard it put best by this guy, um, Rich Paul in New Hampshire. And I was asking him about anarcho-capitalism and he said, and I don't think, I think there's a lot of anarcho-capitalists that are more, they're like, no, it has to be capitalism. But he said that anarcho-capitalism could represent just an anarchism in general could represent right. a like a operating system of just total freedom. And, you know, the operating system is based, the program is non-aggression, let people do things and experiment peace and freedom. And then on top of that, you build little programs. So it's like, we can have our little freedom cell based on agorism kind of libertarian thing here. The, the communists or the communitarian types or the people that are leaning more socialist, they can go try to experiment with this over here, you know, and it could kind of be similar to how federalism was supposed to be. Maybe actually yeah. it wasn't ever supposed to be like that. I think the central government was always supposed to be big and crazy, even in this country, but it was supposed to, there was an idea that it could be these competing states that have differing philosophies. These laboratories, and practices. these laboratories for that's right. Yep. So you can test things out. Yep. Yeah, and, uh -huh. and it could be like city states. Go ahead. I'm sorry. It just you know instead of states, there could be city states or little micro communities, and then the micro communities could band together, and we could even do trade with the socialist community that's you know 20 miles down the road or whatever. And mm -hmm. it's a great argument against the the progressives and even you know, Republicans that it's a great argument against the system as it is because the people are like, we need to have universal health care and we need this policy and that policy. Or we, and there's conservatives that are like, we shouldn't have marijuana be legal. And it's like, okay, well, why don't you guys do that over there? And if that's what you want, really, then you could do that over there. And we're going to do things this way over here. And we're going to honor each other. And there's gonna be mutual respect. And we're going to leave you alone. And you grant us that same thing to, to leave us alone and then mm -hmm. let's experiment maybe your society collapses because the price calculation problem with socialism maybe it ends up thriving and it's like a little like everyone always points to like denmark and scandinavia and stuff it's like okay well give it a try maybe it works maybe it's a beautiful thing maybe not whatever i think our thing i think the free market thing would would really work well at meeting people's needs and wants and right and uh, innovating and be, you know, a lot of people being wealthy and having access to the things they want in life. And yeah. 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 Well, look, man, we're running up on an hour. Um, you want to, you want to, any closing statements uh, before uh, you give your plugs? Um, I think that with the coronavirus pandemic taking place and the subsequent response of, local state federal governments even 
supranational governmental bodies like the World Health Organization, it presents a real opportunity after this to come out and say, hey, fellow humans, maybe we can do things differently from here on out. And of course, the powers that be, the ruling class, they're going to come out and say, we need to do things differently, and they're going to have more centralization, more surveillance, more control. But it's an opportunity for us as well to come out and say, perhaps we need to decentralize our food production systems, our local economies, the way we organize ourselves socially. So a lot of people are really upset and a lot of people are focusing on the growing tyranny. And if that's what you focus on, then that's what you'll see and that's what your life will be. But I'm choosing to focus on the opportunity and the beauty that I see in the world. And I think we are facing a real opportunity now to come out and present an alternative way of doing things. And I think agorism, counter-economics, mutual aid, decentralized food production, um, self-defense groups, and then freedom cells as far as a social organization goes, there's a real time for these ideas to flourish and for for us to put them in play. Because again, it's Mm -hmm. like we can talk about them. The podcast is great uh, for educating people, but I hope the listeners will not be like, wow, that sounds like a cool thing. I'm glad I listened to that, or I'm going to go read this book, right? But instead, Mm -hmm. they're like, I'm going to take some of these ideas and put them into practice because it's the doing that makes a big difference. The knowing is one thing. It's the doing that will actually create the free society that we're all yearning for so desperately. Right. Uh, And I agree with you. And there is like, especially with libertarians, there's, I I was having this conversation with a a buddy of mine last week on one of the podcasts. And um, I, I, there's such this, this desire or need to, to feel um, morally superior and the, to just continue to focus on all the bad things that the government does. And gr- rightfully, in order to move people into the mindset of freedom, sure, point out all these horrible, evil things that the government's doing, but don't ever forget to focus on the things that you can do for yourself and the positive steps that you can take to move yourself forward. Because uh, you don't want to get tunnel vision, you know, just sitting there focused on all the evils. So you have, you're making a really valid point there. Yep. Yep. I appreciate how you put that for sure. There yeah. is like an exceptionalism and like a arrogant kind of streak in the Liberty movement. And we got to be a little more humble. Um, I think our ideas will be more well received if we're like, Hey, I I honestly don't know if this is the best approach, but I think that it could really have some positive benefits for, for us as a society. So let's give it a try. And then the best way to educate people rather than talking about it is to show people. So when we have our freedom cell organization and the person is like, Hey, well, what about healthcare? I'm concerned about how poor people will pay for their health care. And then you're like, well, you know, here's an example from last month. Uh, Tony and Margaret, their kid had this issue and we were able to crowdfund the hospital bill and they got great health care and this is how it works. So it's not just an idea. We're actually doing it. Do you want to join us? Yeah, no, that's a great idea. All right, man. Well, let, give me all your plugs. Tell me about your new podcast. Oh yeah, so I just uh, started producing a lot more content lately. Um, so I and I started up the Live Free Now show, which is something I did years ago. So people can go to livefreenow.show, livefreenow.show, and subscribe to our podcast. And then a lot of my videos can be found on the Conscious Resistance Network.com, the Conscious Resistance Network.com. And I'd love people to give Kratom a try if they'd like to. You can get a free ounce. Again, it's the powderized leaf of the Kratom evergreen tree. The red varieties are good for pain, relaxation, help with sleep. The green and white varieties are a little more uplifting, energetic, good for focus, motivation, stress, and anxiety, especially in these crazy times. It helps to just kind of put your mind at ease, put your body at ease too. You can go to free ounce of Kratom. Yeah, free ounce of Kratom.com, free ounce of Kratom.com, and you just pay $5 shipping and handling, and I'll send you a free ounce. And then um, if people want to boost their immune system or get some colloidal silver or colloidal silver-based hand sanitizer, that website's bravehealthstore.com, bravehealthstore.com. And then one more thing, I I launched a news aggregator for health freedom news called the Health Mm -hmm. Freedom Report. You can find it at healthfreedom.report, healthfreedom.report. If people want to stay on top of the latest 
coronavirus news from a uh, Liberty Health Freedom perspective, that's the spot to go, healthfreedom.report. Well, that's awesome, man. I really appreciate your time. No problem. Oh, and one more thing, freedomcells.org. There may be a group in your area or you can start a group in your area. Oh, yeah. And uh, actually practice this idea, freedomcells.org. Yeah, good good idea. We, we, we should definitely get that in there here at the last second. So, <laughs> all right, man. Well, I really do appreciate your time. I know, like I said, I know you don't do a whole lot of podcast interviews anymore. And it was, it was really gracious of you to come on here and give us your time. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. All right, brother. You have a good one. Okay. Hey, thanks, man. Take care. Yeah, you too. That was John Bush. I am Tommy Salmons. Late.